of Christ, my brethren, let us read from the letter of the Apostle Paul to the Philippians, <clears throat> chapter 1 and verse 27. First letter to the Corinth Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27, by the grace of our Lord. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you, or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conduct which you saw in me and now hear in me. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or revelries, but in lowliness of mind let each other, let each esteem others better than himself. And let each one look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in the appearance as a man, humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, <coughs> to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work on your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. Amen. The Apostle Paul has absolute trust in Timothy. Why? Well, because he knows that... Timothy will care sincerely about the state of the brethren in Philippi. He has absolute trust in this man because he does not seek his own, but the things which are of Christ Jesus. He has trust in the Apostle Paul, but also God. Timothy has learned to wait for Christ to confirm his work. The Apostle Paul has learned to wait for Jesus Christ to work in his life. But now the question is, very important indeed, Christ, what does Christ expect from Paul, from Timothy, 
from the Philippians and from us. We are waiting for Christ and Christ will come and Christ will act and he has acted many times and he will intervene. But possibly the most important thing since the, our waiting exists in the Lord for it says the chosen young men will fade completely. Only those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength like the eagles. So it is very good for us to wait on the Lord, to wait for the intervention, the coming, the actions, activities of God, because when we wait on the Lord, like Elijah, like the widow who believed in the word of God, then our power that will fade because of our outward situation will be renewed. It will be renewed every day. Every day as the power of an eagle is renewed. And this is very important. But the most important thing of all is that as we know that those who wait on the Lord are for our blessing and our good, what matters and it is more important is what does the Lord expect from us for His glory? We are waiting, but He is also waiting. What does Christ expect from you for His glory? We are waiting for Christ for our own blessing, but also Christ is waiting for his glory and many times we forget that even God has requests and petitions from us while we always think that only we have requirements and petitions toward God but if this isn't the right way this isn't how we ought to do it the right way is yes we have our petitions. Yes, we have our requests. Yes, we're expecting answers from the Lord. But wait a second and think that your relationship with Christ is and must be both ways. I'm waiting from Him, but also Christ is waiting from us. I expect from him and he expects from me. I, man, want things from God, from Christ. But also Christ says, I, God, am expecting and want things from you. Christ comes and says, I'm your friend. Because whatever I've heard from my father, I'm telling you. But he wants you to say, I, Lord Jesus, am your friend, because whenever I heard from my Father, from our Father, I want to tell you and to do. <laughs> my dear brethren, it is very important for us to realize that our relationship with Christ is not only to take, but a lot more it is for me to sacrifice to Him, to give. The kingdom of God was likened to somebody who found a treasure in the field. A treasure. But so he can take it, he has to sell whatever he has, so he can begin to buy the plot of land that has the treasure. So the kingdom of heaven is also like a merchant, who is a good merchant, and he deals good uh, precious pearls. And Christ is this merchant who the one, so that he may buy the good pearl, he sold everything. He made himself of no reputation so he can save us. My dear brethren, it is not good for us to stand in the presence of God and only ask from God. The best thing is, with greater repayment and reward, with greater pleasure from God, 
is for us to seek remission of sins and forgiveness, but also to offer Him. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. To whom? To God. That is holy and pleasing. To whom? To God. And this, this offering is your sensible worship. It is what you offer to Christ. It is what you sacrifice to God. What was this thing that, fav- that pleased God on earth, Christ on earth, so much? It was the offering of three women who broke at his feet the most precious thing that they had, the, most, the precious mirror because of the one who loved them. This is a question. Lord, how will I be greatly beloved? Do you want this? Do I want this? Do you want to become greatly beloved to your Lord and your name to be remembered forever and ever? Break today at the feet of Christ the precious flask of fragrant oil that you're giving me because it is pre- precious. Offer Him anything precious that you have. What is the most precious thing that you have? What did God ask from Abraham? The most precious thing that he had for him. Isaac. Sacrifice. What did God offer for us? The most precious thing that he had. His only begotten son. For God loved the world so much that he did not spare his only begotten son. So much will you love. Will God love you when you do not spare what you love very much. So offer. And sit down and think with prayer, with respect, but also very carefully. Personally, from you, whoever you may be, no matter how old you are, no matter what you are, What is this thing that God wants that if you offer it to Him, you will make Him rejoice and you will transform His love, His eternal love, into a special love. What was this thing that made Daniel greatly beloved to God? What else other than his offering? What else other than what he gave everything for God? What is this that has made John greatly beloved? His offering. He didn't complain. He did not, would not ask for things. He always fell in the embrace of Christ. He offered him his love. His great love. Christ, uh, John offered his great love to Christ and he has boldness to say it is the disciple that Christ loved very much. Today, my dear brethren, it is the day of the great beloved servants, many servants and men servants of God. How will you become greatly beloved? For starters, do you care about this? Do you care about it? Have you ever thought of it? Have you ever thought of making Christ tell you, my servant who is well beloved, greatly beloved servant? You know what this means? Of course, God loves us all. Of course, God is love. Of course, Christ wants all people to be saved. Of course, Christ wants to reveal the knowledge of the truth to us, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But he wants to work. He wants to discuss. He wants to draw near. He wants to listen. He wants to say to somebody, you, my son, are greatly beloved. 
Do you want this? Whoever wants this, let him raise his hand. It is the day of the greatly beloved. I want all of us to be greatly beloved of the Lord. It is not the big question mark of what do you expect? I'm expecting to see you. I am expecting you to make a greatly beloved servant of yours, child of yours. Can I become like that? I can't. Can Christ make me? He can. When? When I ask from, from him. When I tell him, Jesus, please. I'm really jealous of this. I really want this. I really desire this. What do you want me to do? So that you may consider me. So that I may have the chance, the prospect, the, the possibility for you to come into my life and transform me. Not only from glory to glory, from grace to grace, but from love to love. Hallelujah. I want this so much. Glory be to God. And who is the greatly beloved man of God the Father so that I may be like him? Who is it? Only Jesus Christ, my dear brethren. He is the greatly beloved servant. He is the greatly beloved son. He is the greatly beloved messenger of God. For that reason, the Apostle Paul says what? Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Let us be like Christ today. Can you imagine, my dear brother, if we go to our Father today and tell him, Father, my God, transform me today that I may become the image of Christ in my words in my behavior in my work but more most of all Lord in my offering in my obedience to you in my offering that I may be able to offer you my life my glory, myself. For that reason, the Apostle Paul says what? Let this, be, this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Being in the form of God, did not consider Robert to be equal with God, to take a different appearance. He did not lose his divinity, the essence of his divinity. But while he was only in the form of God, he became in the form of man. And he did not consider this, this as if somebody stole something from him. What does he want from you? From the form of a free man that you are. Of a child of God. Of a glorious child of God. Whose name is written in the book of life that you do not consider it robbery to be a servant of God and of men. A servant of God and of men. Don't believe this, that it is robbery. He is not stealing your liberty. He is not taking away your glory. He is not robbing you from your personality. When he tells you that you must be like him and take on the form of a bondservant. But he's telling you, do this thing. And if you do it, the way that you ought to do it, then my joy will be complete. Then you will be greatly beloved servant. Like, like my only begotten son, the divine God. My only son became a servant in whom I was well pleased. What does God want? The offering of God. He wanted you to reject always your opinion. To not take your personality into account. To accept Whatever God permits in your life, 
that you accept it with joy, with blessing, that you may be God and to enjoy to be God, and so that he may help us. He says, consider each others, esteem others better than yourselves. And this was very serious for me. A few years ago, I was in Cyprus, and a young man had come. He was 18 or 19 years old. He was in drugs, a ruined family, unemployed, a mess. He came into the church one, two, three times. I wasn't there. I went also sometime. And during the sermon, I said uh, from the Word of God, esteem others better than yourselves. And when he stepped down, we had a Bible study and we spoke and he said, so, Mr. Corovesis, do you esteem me better than you? I looked at him. I said, what can I answer? I must speak the truth. I looked at him again. And I changed the discussion, I did not have the boldness to say yes. And I came back to Greece. When I came back to Greece, I was working, at, working in an industry. And there was a financial director, a vice general manager. I had authority, humanly speaking. I'm not saying this is boasting, but I'm saying it for what will follow. The imp the owner came and he said, you see this? These are my children. Train them. I looked at his children. They were very small, not in age, in knowledge. They had limited knowledge. And at that moment, the Lord visited me and I began to, to tremble. These children were above you, are above me. You know what I was? I was an employee. You know what they were? They were owners of the industry because they were children of the person who owned the industry. I looked at myself then and I said, if this man, this person goes and tells his dad, Fire him. His father will fire me. If this uh, young man goes and tells his father, the person is very good. He helped me. And I repeat this. If he goes to his father and he says, he's very good. He helped me. He stood by me. In my ignorance, in my weakness. Give him a raise. He will give me a raise. And there, my dear brethren, I wept. I said, here is how the gospel of Christ is right. This is how I can see my brother who is young, who is small, who is insignificant. Forgive me, Lord, the least of our brethren, as the word of God says, that he is greater than me because he is a child of my boss. And what am I? I am an employee. I am a servant. That is, I am a pastor. Yeah, but... I am just an employee. The Lord is my boss. And his children are the bosses. I am nothing. I am zero. He has me here. He keeps me here. As, lo as long as I do my job well. If I believe that I did something better. He tells me, get out of here. I'll get somebody else who's better than you. What am I? I am a wretched employee who thinks that he has some authority but it is not this way the boss has given me the authority that i have and whatever he wants he gives it to me whenever he wants he can raise my wage whenever he wants he can decrease my wave and wa wage and whatever he wants he can fire me and i said it's so great to see my brethren in this way all my brethren that they are children of my employer children of my king, that they are children of the Almighty. And what am I? I am a wretched person, a servant. I'm useless. Whom he wants 
and he keeps me around. He has compassion on me and he keeps me around. He gives me mercy. How do I give mercy to a poor man? Well, in the same way, he gives mercy to me because I am poor and nothing. It is the mercy of the Lord, the fact that we are still here today. It is the mercy of the Lord that I am here. It is the mercy of the Lord, the compassion of Christ. Now truly, as much as I think of that moment, I say, here are the children of my employer. And what am I? I am just a servant. I am an employee. I am nothing. I am a little employee who is useless. An employee who is wretched and vile. Who finds grace by his Lord. And this is what matters, my dear brethren, that we find grace. So, what does God want from me now? He wants me to be a good servant. This is what He wants from me. He wants me to do my job well. What did my boss want? He wanted me to be a good financial director. To be obedient, to not do whatever I want, to be on time, to be diligent, to do my job right. And if I make a mistake, to correct it quickly and to look after the interest and the glory of my boss. And not only that, but also the children of my boss. Now things became clear to me. My mind had opened and God opens it even further now. So that I may understand my own wretchedness and your glory. So that I may understand what an empty tin can I am and useless. And the only thing that God expects from me is to diligently do the few things that he asks for me to do. He doesn't have demands because he loves me. (coughs) Amen, my brethren? For that reason, what does the Apostle Paul say? He says, For me to live is gain, is Christ. To live for me is Christ. To die is profit. And I know that I will remain here so that I may partake in your in your joy. So I may do my my job well. You must progress and rejoice. But even though because I am not only an employee. You also, father, are an employee. You, mother, are also an employee. And you have to remain for the progress of your children and for the joy of your children. So how will I become greatly beloved if I manage to make you progress, my wife, my children, the church, and that you may have joy? Let me not be a producer of sorrow, but of joy. But so that I may be a producer of joy and of great progress, what must I do? I must be obedient to Christ. What was Elijah for the widow? He produced joy. What was Elijah? Elijah produced progress. Why did Christ send Elijah to the widow? So that he may serve her. So that he may preserve her alive. So that he may raise her child. And the child will get sick later on. Why did God send Elijah? So he can heal her son. Why did he send him to Sarabath of Sidon? For the widow. And because of the widow. Because of the widow. Because of the... Of the jar of the widow and of the can of oil, he ate a lot. He ate richly as well. So what does the Apostle Paul say? I offer myself as a burnt off sacrifice. And I rejoice with you. I rejoice because you rejoice. In the same manner, you also must rejoice with me. This is the secret. That you have joy that I may rejoice with your joy, that I may be happy and you may rejoice with my joy. And who will be glorified then? Christ, God, and our joy. 
Just think if we put it the other way around. If I produce sorrow to you, how does God see me? If I offend you, how does God see me? If I afflict you, how does God see me? And be self-justified at the same time. You don't understand anything I understand. My dear brethren, let this remain with us. You are an employee. All the rest are your bosses because they are sons of your boss. Just think of a church, a family, where we consider ourselves as employees, all of us, in the service of our brother. What a beautiful family, what a beautiful church this will be. That there be no one who says, I am, but he says, I, the poor man and just an employee. This word, the Lord told me, little employee, because I thought that I was the boss. I was wretched and vile. You're just an employee, he said. <clears throat> Glory be to God. But also now, let me not think that I am a pastor and that this means anything. I am just an employee. And all the authority and the grace begins and ends with God. Right, our Heavenly Father. Amen, my brethren. What do we expect? Christ. What does Christ expect? Our service. But, without groaning, without doubts, without thinking, because this way, you will receive and and the wicked and and the wicked and crooked situation uh, generation you will shine shine like the moon and the stars you will shine in the world because you hold fast to the word of life my dear brethren we hold the word of eternal life in our hands but let us never forget we are employees and the service of our brethren. We will never become owners. We will never become lords. We will always be priests and kings of the Most High and the service of the Almighty God and of His children. Amen.